I hope everybody, Ian Whiteley. Uh, I'm going to do uh, some oldies and some new ones. Uh, I'm going to start with this one. Um, it's about how you qualify to be in this country at the moment, and uh, obviously not everybody qualifies. It's called making a point. Catazina didn't have a skill; they didn't pay her much, but Catazina was invaluable. She had the human touch. She hadn't been to uni, had no meaningless degree, but she excelled in the school of life and made my mum her tea. It seems that care is valueless, as is your place of birth, when it comes to scoring points and determining your worth. Those who earn a small fortune are welcome with open arms, whilst we can't get British workers to pick fruit on British farms. So stand up and be counted, all you economically inactive. It's not enough to take, we now want you all to give. It's no excuse to claim that you're retired at school or ill. We've got you a blueprint. Where there's a way, there must be a will. We'll have some octogenarian to serve your coffee black, and the kids will be back up chimneys now we've got our country back. If you care for a relative rather than going out to work, we can save the pittance paid to a carer, so there's another perk. We'll have hospitals full of doctors and not a nurse in sight. We're protecting British jobs. Don't worry, it'll be all white. Meanwhile, we will welcome bankers, multinational CEOs and that certain class of socialite who plough the profits up their nose. This is modern Britain where Johnny Foreigner is kept out and there are more chiefs than Indians. And if you're in any doubt that this will be for the better, then let me tell you this. It could be you they'll look to to clear up the vomit, shit and piss. Some people are struggling with all this staying in, um, but I'm a fairly isolated person myself anyway. Uh, this is called End of Days. The fact that I'm quite antisocial is a blessing in dark times like these, when you're treated like a pariah if you develop a cough or a sneeze, when they're telling us to wash our hands and not just after we pee, when I've been doing that for years because of my OCD. I'm also a bit of a hoarder. It's always been one of my goals to ensure I have plenty of toothpaste and never run out of loo rolls. But that's suddenly become quite a challenge with all these bastards buying in bulk. So I'm sat here self-isolating with time on my hands for a sulk. My favourite food is Italian with a close second Chinese. But that's all blown out of the water. Now I'm living on crackers and cheese. I've so many cans in the cupboard it's turning into a joke. Baked beans, soup and mushy peas and 43 cans of Diet Coke. I'm not shaking hands anymore except when there's no paper towel and the diet I'm on is clogging me up and double grouting me bowel. My complexion is turning quite pasty as I'm no longer getting sunlight because I don't go out in the daytime, I just hang around open spaces at night. So they reckon this virus could kill me. I'm sure what they're saying is true, but my friends are not going to miss me when the first thing they ask who are you? It's time to come out of the bunker because life has always been about luck. There's a killer disease in the country. Just be careful and don't give a fuck. Um, I wrote this. At 11 o'clock on the day we exited Europe. It's called Withdrawal Method When Being Fucked. There's only 27 when there used to be 28. Some of us don't like it and others think it's great. Some are hyperventilating because we've got our country back and being obnoxious children with their little Union Jack. Some are crying tears as they erase a golden star and want a second chance like it's Euro VAR. Some are being silly, others being daft. Europe looked quite sullen and of course, Nigel laughed. Donald looked smug as his pulse began to quitten, salivating over selling as his chlorinated chicken. Irishmen were telling us there has to be a border and John was heard to bellow, Order! Order! But there wasn't any order, there wasn't any sense and not one opinionated fucker was sitting on the fence. You were either in or out or you didn't bloody care. 
which meant that you got out and then claimed it wasn't fair. There isn't a way forward. There's not a cunning plan, and it doesn't mean you can do it just because you say you can. So tonight, bang on 11, as someone let off a rocket, I'm praying that the sparks hit the fucker in the pocket, that Boris gets his comeuppance for overseeing this pure farce, and he can stick his fucking flag up his fucking ass. You see, I'm not really angry over what I can't control, but I'm telling you this, if you voted for this own goal, and you start to weep and moan because you fell for all the lies, when the idiots can't deliver and you're showing some surprise, I will ask you how you voted, and believe me, have no doubt, you will find little sympathy if you voted out. I'm not sitting on the fence. I uh, like the design. Hand done. Fifteen pound to you. This is one that uh, been performing with Bad Company. Um, I wrote it as a, a solo song. It's three poems in one about the state of America. The first part is called USMF and it covers the uh, orange goblin that's in charge. The second part's called Lady Liberty Weeps, and it's about uh, Black Lives Matter. And the third part is called Safety Off, and it's about their antiquated gun law. When the KKK and the Kremlin are sharing their vodka and rye, when redneck white supremacists are making Lady Liberty cry, when the land of the free is walled in, pesky Mexicans can't get by, that's the day the rest of us watches America die. When the White House houses a bigot, a misogynist locker room fly. When a multi-billionaire stands for mama's apple pie. When a name shines on a tower that reaches up to the sky. That's the day the rest of us watches America die. When a straw-thatched umpa lumper peddles a conspiracy lie. When a tax-dodging privileged hypocrite tells workers he's their kind of guy. When a bully is sitting as president and parents tell the children why, that's the day the rest of us watches America die. In a Minnesota precinct on a Minnesota street, the day starts like any other for the Baton Rouge elite. In the land of the brave, in the land of the free, a cop with a pistol shoots liberty. A man reaches for a wallet with a target on his back, red, white and blue all the patrolman sees is black where the gun is law the sheriff of the west has immunity to kill wearing a star on his chest and this is the country that sets itself above the rest of the world and preaches peace and love but it can't control the forces it creates to protect and it can't control the hatred it chooses to elect where every standoff is resolved by the gun and redneck lobbyists believe the lies they have spun. Now in Dallas, Texas, there are cop killers on the street. The day ends like any other. The cycle is complete. The FBI and the CIA got them. Good old boys in the KKK got them. Even Doris Day got them, but it don't make them safe. Kids in their daddy's cars got them. Rednecks in Dallas bars got them. Sheriffs with tin stars got them, but it don't make them safe. The white and black and brown got them, old folks in Midwest towns got them. Even the White House clown got them, but it don't make them safe. Clint Eastwood and John Wayne got them, the holy and insane got them. I've heard that Citizen Kane got them, but it don't make them safe. Shopkeepers in the stores got them, vets returning from the wars got them. Pimps and two-bit whores got them but it don't make them safe. The Washington Post and Fox got them. Randy High School jocks got them. Snipers in tower blocks got them, but it don't make them safe. Heroes on TV got them. The brave and the free got them. Babies on their mama's knees got them, but it don't make them safe. The Waltons and the Bradys got them. The good guys and their ladies got them. Tupac and Slim Shady's got them, but it don't make them safe. Every Independence Day got them, every bullet that goes astray got them, the whole of the USA got them, and they're never going to be safe. 16th of October 1991, 23 dead, Lubis Cafeteria, Killeen, Texas. 4th of December 2012, 27 dead, Sandy Hook Elementary, Newtown, Connecticut. 16th of April 2007, 32 dead, 
Virginia Tech, Blacksburg, Virginia. 12th of June, 2016. 49 dead. Pulse nightclub, Orlando, Florida. 1st of October, 2017. 58 dead. Mandalay Bay Resort, Las Vegas. And counting. Um, <clears throat> I thought I'd do some in a tribute as well, uh, not just sort of shouty stuff. Uh, my dad fought in the Second World War. He was a sergeant major in Burma, and um, when he came home, he uh, he brought a, a trophy home, a bayonet, which he um, he hid in the house, and my mum found it. And she went mad because obviously he'd got kids, and they might find it. So she told me to hide it down the garden in a shed, and. Uh, we kept pestering him to find out what he'd done in the war and, you know, um, if he killed anybody. And um, he uh, he wouldn't tell us until we were a lot older. And uh, there's two poems. One's a new one that I've written about why he went to fight and why they all went to fight. Um, and the other one's about the incident with the bayonet. This first one's called Son of My Father. What did you do in the war, Dad? I fought against fascist son. And were you frightened there, Dad? Did you want to turn round and run? Yes, I was frightened there, son. So don't believe the lies that are spun about the death and the glory of war, boy. There is death, but of glory there's none. Thanks for all that you did, Dad, and thanks for beating the Hun. What did you do for a job, Dad? I worked in an office, son. Thanks for the money you made, Dad, and thanks for marrying Mum. What did you want for your life, Dad? I wanted good children, son. Did you want them to be like you, Dad? Did you want them to do what you'd done? Why won't you answer that last one, Dad? Has the cat got your tongue? No, I wanted them to live in peace, son, and not to have to carry a gun. I wanted them to be happy and for all of their days to be fun. And there would have been none of that boy if those fascists had won. This is a tribute to my dad called The Burn It In The Shed. They put it there in 49 in a woodworm riddled drawer, wrapped it in a greasy rag, a remnant from the war. On top of it he laid his medals, nothing more was said until the day my father took the bayonet from the shed. We had pestered many times, and he had said perhaps, when we asked him if he'd killed any krauts or any japs, his eyes fixed on something far away, as though searching for the dead, but we found out what we wanted when he took the bayonet from the shed. He was a sergeant major in the hellhole that was Burma, where the Japanese snipers would target you on a murmur. He was proud of the campaign and the boys that he had led, but he never, ever talked about the bayonet in the shed. He didn't hate all foreigners, and he said the greatest worker that he'd ever met in the war was good old Johnny Gurkha, that being brave wasn't about killing, he was happy when they fled. Then he went down the garden and took the bayonet from the shed. He was gone a short while, and when we saw him coming back, he was no longer marching along a hero's track. We witnessed the aged warrior return with heavy tread, shoulders slumped in surrender with the bayonet from the shed. He moved the cloth reverently and laid the medals by its side, and for the first time in my life we watched as my father cried. We sat with him and looked at it and thought of bodies that had bled after being introduced to the bayonet in the shed. Uh, quite a lot of these uh, poems I, uh, I take into the studio and uh, and try and do some songs with them and, and Bart Company have done the same. Uh, I do record my own so stuff as songs under the project title The Crows of Albion um, and I've got a few CDs out and um, I've also got three poetry books out. If anybody's interested, um, you can check out my website. It's www.thecrowsofalbion.com Also, I think this event's going to be um, hopefully raising some funds for an organisation that's um, 
close to my heart, and I know it's close to Jeff Arama's as well. Uh, we're part of a, a movement called We Shall Overcome, and um, we do gigs and try and raise money for uh, local um funds for, for food banks and for people in need locally. And uh, there's a Just Giving page, which I think is on a link um, on the invite on this. So if you're watching this, even if you can only spare a pound or two, please click on that link and give what you can, because every penny that's raised for We Shall Overcome goes directly to the places where it's needed. And this weekend gone, the 11th of April, there was a big um, there was a gig online uh, which raised something like uh, twenty-seven thousand um, pounds, which will help hopefully see us through the coronavirus crisis and uh, get funds to the front line where it's needed. So anything you can give to uh, after watching this, that will go towards the same cause. This next one um, is a title of um, a CD that the last CD that I recorded under my own. Uh, project um, it's called Screaming Blue Murder and it's about all the things that are wrong with this country at the moment I'm screaming blue murder at the state of the nation and how we blame our ills on Muslims and immigration talking about people as other an infestation I'm screaming blue murder I'm screaming blue murder at the bankers greed and the people on the street who we can't seem to feed the way that we trample on sexuality and creed I'm screaming blue murder. I'm screaming blue murder at the disheartening mess of the education system, transport and the NHS. And how we're going to get out of it is anybody's guess. I'm screaming blue murder. I'm screaming blue murder at the neo-fascist rise about how we're indoctrinated by Tory newspaper lies and the way we look away when an industry dies. I'm screaming blue murder. I'm screaming blue murder that the rich are getting more while zero hour contracts are hammering the poor and the way we still find money to support another war. I'm screaming blue murder. I'm screaming blue murder at intolerance and hate about the way you can't criticise a persecution state without being dragged into anti-Semitic debate. I'm screaming blue murder. I'm screaming blue murder for all the bluster and fuss caused by unsupported facts on the side of a bus. How just one third of the country somehow speak for all of us. I'm screaming blue murder. I'm screaming blue murder at what this government's done to the weak and vulnerable, to the poor man and his son. And as they stand accused with a smoking gun, I'm screaming blue murder. My heart is on the left and my blood is red. Austerity doesn't work, it has to be said. Our ethics and our val values are morally dead. I'm screaming blue murder. Um, here's another one I wrote as a song which was um, the title track of the last Bart Company CD um, and it's about how working class people went to war and were promised a lamp fit for heroes when they returned um, but they're still waiting in most cases um, it was written for a festival that's in Wakefield where the miners bring all the banners into town it's called Raising the Standards with Banners Held High you said that you wanted a land fit for heroes, a place to call home that they show off with pride, but somewhere along the way you forgot the reasons they fought and the reasons they died. They thought they were fighting for honour and justice, suppressing the tyrants and saving our land, returned to a country that punished the workers for banding together and making a stand. So your songs are all dirges to heroically fallen, your words all platitudes for loss of life, your actions speak louder than all of your promises, where lies a pandemic, pandemic and betrayals are rife. Because they died in the trenches with promises hollow, driving them forward and ringing in ears, while you pocketed money that should have been spent, making jobs for survivors and easing the fears. Now we march all together and sing for the future, while honouring those who were lost in the past. We still want to believe all the promises made as our young men were slaughtered, dismembered and gassed. Prosperity offered like chocolate at Christmas, peace in our times and everlasting hope. All that they got were more broken dreams, more pointless wars, more money for old rope. 
The boss has got fat on the toil of their workers. The bank has got fat on their interest-rich loans. And the man who came back from the war that he fought in was treated no better than their graveyard of bones. So bang the drum, comrade, and never forget that if silence is demanded, then shout and be loud. And don't let this government try to sell history as though it is something for which we should be proud. A century's passed and they've destroyed the mines. They've doused the steel furnaces, grounded the docks, left northern communities suffering and reeling in the self-proclaimed privatised school of hard knocks. There are still poor people living in poverty. Food banks are prevalent, folk on the street. They cannot look after the homeless and feeble. The old cannot pay for their lighting and heat. From the mud of the trenches they came back home, the future as grey as the claws on their back. They demanded we give them something to cling to, a future of light in their visions of black. England's green fields, the red of the blood, the gold we were promised, the blue of the sky. These are the colours we raise as our standard, marching together with banners held high. Um, okay, got a couple more. I'm doing all right for time, I think. Now, this first one, uh, my missus says I've got to perform it because I don't do enough comedy. Um, so this is one about watching wildlife programs and realising there's a species out there that are actually worse off than uh, the human species. It's called Nature's Banquet. I am the humble wildebeest, Mother Nature's moving feast. My mother warned, don't wander off or you'll end up a lion's scoff. Some folk call me a gnu. I've heard it all, there's nothing new. In puns that you may decide to frame around this inauspicious name. I guess I'll never have a life of family bliss with kids and wife. Cause every day before I meet her, some fucking leopard tries to eat her. There's really nothing that is meaner than losing your fiance to a spotted hyena. I'm telling you lads, you should have seen her. They picked her before a speedy zebra. Every time I see that chap from off the telly spouting crap about the predators and prey, I feel I have to shout up, Hey, instead of filming all this slaughter, I really think you really ought to spare a thought for wee poor bovide day, getting chewed on every day. His name is Attenborough, I think, and when he turns up, there's no time to think. We all rush off and hide in long grass and hope the TV crews will pass and film something about baboons and how they all use twigs as spoons. But no, they're just here for the cull and won't leave till that lion's full. So every year we all migrate, trying to avoid our inevitable fate. A takeaway for a big cat. Would you like some antelope with that? I'm telling you I've had enough of being classified as basic food stuff. It's a pain in the ass at the very least, being a fucking wildebeest. Right, that's about it from me. I'm going to do one more. The one place I haven't mentioned, Bad Company, I have a website as well, <clears throat> which is www.badcompany.co.uk. So if you want to hear any more ranting poetry and hot tunes then have a look there me and Jeff Arama and Gordon Zola and Tony Kinsella aka Rocky Punky Cheesy and Bolshe Bad. I'm leaving you with this thanks for listening my name's Ian Whiteley this is about childhood it's called Orchard Lane and I wrote it today don't get, don't get caught he'll fucking kill you Emerald green and ruby red jewels just out of your reach. Treasures in the strawberry bread bed. He's got a dog with vicious fangs. Black as coal, we watch him prowl. He snarls and gnashes, gnashes foaming jaws and scare, scares us with his hellhound growl. Bide your time and take your chances, remaining hidden behind the wall till old man Harris and his dog are safely out of beck and call. Shift your ass and get a move on. We scramble over sunbaked bricks and drop down to the shaded orchard. This is how we get our kicks. Grab an, grab an handful, hurry up. We rush to gather windfall fruit. Strawberries, blackberries and apples. The currency of childhood loot. He's bleeding, coming, do a runner. Pelting for the nearby gate with precious cargo being lost in our haste to escape our fate. 
Fucking hell, I'm fucking knackered. Safe, we divvy up the spoils. A moment's pleasure on the lips, and then each one of us recoils. Fucking hell, these apples are sour. Grubs and maggots in the buries. Pears that taste a carbolic soap. Mould on the inviting cherries. It weren't really worth the effort. So we never went back there again to scrump for apples, steal the fruit, risk life and death on Orchard Lane. Thanks for listening. See you all later.